All right, welcome everybody. This is Jen Maleka, a functional diagnostic nutrition practitioner, and I also have Molly on the line. Hey, Molly. Hey, Jen. Excited to talk to you guys this evening about Activate and Upgrade Your Autoimmune Healing. We have so much juicy stuff to share with you, um, all of our best practices and tools and techniques that we've used with ourselves and with our clients to help um, either prevent autoimmune or to reverse it for those who have it as well. Um, so the webinar is definitely for everybody because what we're going to talk about tonight is how autoimmunity actually starts way before you even receive a diagnosis in regards to it. So even if you don't have an autoimmune condition right now, that doesn't mean there isn't one that's a brewing. So we'll talk about that and the things that we're going to talk about today um, are definitely going to help you to prevent it from becoming something bigger. So let's jump in and um, we want to introduce ourselves for those of you that may not know us um, very well. So Molly, why don't you go ahead and tell the folks a little bit about you and kind of your background and a little bit of your health story. Yeah, of course. Hi everyone, I'm Molly from mollyhamill.com. And so I am a life coach. I'm certified in EQI and meditation and yoga and I don't know. I feel like I have a lot of stuff under my belt, but <laughs> um, I have a couple signature programs, Happy to Heal and Wild Light Warrior. And it's kind of funny because people will ask like, well, you know, in one hand you're, you're focusing on worthiness and then the other you're dealing with like thyroid and autoimmune and I'm like, it's really not different. It's like the same thing. It's just a different outcome, you know, like some of my clients end up getting sick because of the stress and the struggle that we're going to talk about tonight and then others just end up, you know, dealing with anxiety or unhappiness or things like that. So. Um, whichever camp you're in, I work with women, sorry men, um, to, um, you know, up-level their mindset, their lives, so that they can increase their health and happiness levels. And I never expected to be talking about what we're talking about tonight, but I ran my health into the ground because of some of my behavioral tendencies, like perfectionism and stuff like that. And so when I was healing myself, I kept looking for resources that just didn't exist. And I realized, you know, I actually have all these resources through my formal training. So I started applying them to myself and I started healing so fast. And um, then I started attracting clients who were um, in a similar situation where they had these autoimmune diseases or thyroid stuff or adrenal or gut and they were doing all the right things in terms of you know what their doctor was telling them or their health coach and they still weren't healing and it's you know because their bodies weren't trusting them because of um, the um, sorry I just uh, because of the mindset stuff and the lifestyle and the behavioral and the habits and all those things that were interfering so it's kind of my story turn it over to you yeah, and it's kind of how we came to meet each other as well. Yeah, totally. <laughs> Which is awesome. So um, it's funny because Molly and I have known each other for some time. Like we knew each other way back when when we both had different careers and different yeah. jobs. And uh, just kind of acquaintances-wise knew each other. Mm -hmm. And then years later after we both moved on from those corporate careers like the universe kind of brought us back together and it makes sense now we can both look back and be like oh this is totally why because we have very like similar stories in a lot of um, aspects so uh, my story is kind of similar background wise with as like Molly's um, I'm currently right now I'm a functional diagnostic nutrition practitioner like I mentioned earlier and that's a mouthful, like it's a bunch of words that don't really mean a lot to people. So just to um, kind of make it sound like more practical or like give you a little bit more insight on what I do. And I'm, I'm somewhere in between like a naturopath and a health coach. So I do more than just health coaching. I help a lot of people in ways that a naturopath would. I just can't diagnose or treat anything like specifically. So I do a lot of the same testing and I have a lot of the same principles as a lot of naturopaths would. Um, apply with their clients and I basically help people to find the missing pieces to to their health puzzle in a sense because most of my clients that I work with 
um, have gone from practitioner to practitioner, even worked with naturopaths sometimes, and there's still just pieces are missing and they're still suffering or struggling in some kind of way. So I help them to investigate further on what's going on and um, help to you know, give them the language or educate them about how to go back and talk with their doctor or their naturopath about additional things that they might need. So really just empowering people in a sense also to be their own health boss and be educated and knowledgeable and, and know what to ask for and what they need. And this is something that I've experienced myself in my own healing. So I've, you know, dealt with adrenal dysfunction and leaky gut and I had skin cancer at a really young age and then I had mold toxicity which really led to estrogen dominance and eventually Hashimoto's. So I did not think that I was going to be somebody who specialized in autoimmunity myself either, which is as my health story kind of evolved over time, um, then of course, like my education grew in this field, and now I want to help others that have, have, you know, been battling the same ways that I had in the past. And one of the biggest struggles that I had was going to, you know, different types of doctors or practitioners and asking for help and them not really being able to help me because they didn't have all the pieces of the puzzle either. So I really like to help clients kind of zoom out and um, look at their life with a holistic approach, which is going to incorporate a lot of the behavioral things that Molly mentioned a little bit ago too because looking at my story that's something that I certainly can look back on and see like you know my habits like my lifestyle did not really support my health as much as I thought that they did yeah. you know, I was always kind of the picture of perfect health when it came like on paper like when I went to my annual physical I was a personal trainer back um, before I did this so I was that like picture of perfect health, but on the inside I was a total mess. And a lot of that came from the choices that I was making in my lifestyle and the behaviors, like how I was treating my body and myself. So there's, I really see that there's like this perfect blend um, that you need in order to truly like heal the body or to reverse disease or to prevent disease that's going to require like a scientific kind of approach and then also like a spiritual side of approach, which is where Molly and I's work, I think, complements each other really well and kind of what we're going to share with you today and that we've blended both of those aspects along our healing journey, which is so amazing. And we've learned so much from each other, too, which is awesome. Yeah, so. I mean, because the, the similarities were pretty crazy. I mean, like what you were just saying, I mean, I was like listening to all the experts and drinking green juices and doing all these things that on paper were right, but they weren't necessarily right for my body. And then combined with some crazy lifestyle stuff, it just wasn't working. So, you know, it's not like I was out eating Big Macs every day and like creating this storm intentionally in my system. And I think that's like where it can get really confusing for people who think that they're, they're healthy, but then all the stuff is going on inside, which you taught me a lot of. <laughs> yeah. And I think that's so great that you point that out to Molly because I, that's where a lot of people, I see people struggling with that too, that they're like, well, I've tried, why doesn't paleo work for me or why doesn't this work for me or the AIP diet work for me? And that's because there is no such thing as one solution, first of all, and there's no, there's certainly no such thing as one solution that fits all people. And what we're going to kind of show you tonight is that really healing requires like a multifaceted approach. Like you're going to have to come at it from all different angles. And what works for one person is not necessarily going to work for you. So you really have to tune into your body and figure out what is going to work for you. So like in, with my clients, like I don't push a specific type of diet because I know that that doesn't like work for everybody. And one of my biggest mottos is that there's a difference between eating healthy and eating right for your body. Like eating right for your body will incorporate healthy foods, but not every healthy food is right for your body. And that's a big like misconception that is out there essentially. And also know that if you're trying things and you're not getting results, that doesn't mean that the, you know, the system is broken or that that's not working for you or it's not good for you. It just means that there's probably like a bigger picture that you're not looking at on why that thing is not working for you. Like, like we're going to talk about the behavioral things. So maybe you're, you know, green juicing like during the week and then you're like binging on something else over the weekend that is completely like destroying you on the inside out, you know, or you're, you're green juicing and putting all this healthy food into your body, but you still like um, criticize yourself a lot and really like talk bad to yourself all the time. So we're going to talk about how those things interact and can create disease and sickness in the body essentially. 
Awesome. Um, so let's look at our agenda. Like essentially what we want to cover with you guys today is we want to talk about um, the contributing factors. So how did you wind up here? Like if you are struggling with autoimmunity currently, or if we're going to talk about being on the spectrum, if you're just dealing with any type of chronic like ailments, health issues, we're going to talk about like how you kind of wound up there. And then what are the triggers for autoimmune and chronic health conditions, give you some insights on what, you know, led you down this path or what's been contributing to it um, along the way. And then I'm going to touch on some of the science side of things, so like what's happening in your body, how you can investigate it and measure it. And then Molly's going to dive into more of the behavioral side of things, like how your thoughts, feelings, emotions, or lifestyles or um, choices are helping or hindering your health. And then we're both going to be sharing with you how you can activate and upgrade. So what are some of the actions that you can take to activate and upgrade your auto autoimmune healing process or to prevent health issues overall? So are you ready to dive in, Molly? Let's do it. Yeah. So I really want to share this with you guys because I think this is so actually like fascinating and eye-opening and I'm sure Molly when you saw the autoimmune spectrum like I did you could like look back and go oh my gosh my autoimmune process started years ago before I was even diagnosed with anything <laughs> and yeah yeah so this is coaching me on that I was like when we started really thinking about it I was like oh my gosh this goes back to college for sure <laughs> Yes, exactly. So this is, most people don't know that there's like an autoimmune spectrum. They only know about autoimmunity once it's been diagnosed for them. But the reality is, is that you can be on the spectrum, like basically, I even talk with clients that are on the spectrum from a really young age and then over years, like because the triggers are still in place or the things that are contributing to it, like we're going to talk about tonight, continue to grow and manifest, then they just move farther up on the autoimmune spectrum until they are actually diagnosed with something. So you can see visually here the autoimmune spectrum, like um, you start to be on the spectrum when you have one symptom one to two times per month. And there's a list down here of what the symptoms are. So something as simple as having a headache or a migraine, let's say one to two times a month, which most women specifically would like associate with you know, PMS, for example, like, oh, I get a headache during my cycle or like through certain times in my cycle, just having that one symptom one to two times per month can actually maybe um, indicate that you might be on the autoimmune spectrum, which is kind of crazy to think about when you look at, you know, all of these symptoms that are on here. And there's different autoimmune spectrum um, kind of self-test that you can do. So Dr. Amy Myers has one in her book, The Autoimmune Solution, and then Dr. Tom O'Brien also has um, his self-test in the new book that he just came out with, The Autoimmune Fix, where you can go through all of the different symptoms that would be on the spectrum and you can kind of get a score of where you are on the spectrum. But looking at these like symptoms, I know that I can like date back a lot of these things like brain fog was something I had a long time ago, like dark circles under my eyes, congestion all the time, like allergies, um, inability to lose weight is something that I struggled with a lot, and definitely fatigue are the ones that stand out to me that like basically started in my early 20s after I got out of high school and started college. I mean, Molly, when you look at these symptoms, like, what does, what stands out for you and how long do you think that they, like, can you date some of them back to with your journey? Yeah, I mean, a lot of them. Um, definitely, like, the sinus thing. I always had sinus problems. Um, I actually originally reached out to you because of my inability to lose weight. Like, I had just gained a little bit of weight and it just wouldn't go away. It was just stubborn. Um, I had changes in my hair. I didn't lose it, but it just started getting really different, and um, I was having irregular heartbeat stuff and a lot of this, so, yeah. yeah. The hair thing, too, like, that was not something that I noticed in the beginning, but um, once I was actually diagnosed with Hashimoto's, my, uh, like, the upper, like, the, what is this called, the widow's peak kind of area of where most people would have like a widow's peak on the right hand side. I'd actually lost like a chunk of hair there and I didn't even 
realize it until it started growing back because it started growing back really curly. <laughs> yeah. And my hairstylist was like, oh, yeah, she's like, I see that with thyroid people all the time. And, like, it was yeah. so subtle. Like, I just didn't even notice it when it was happening until it started growing back, which was crazy. That's funny. You said I had a patch of – my hair is wavy. Like, I straightened it today. But, like, I had a patch of crazy curly hair back here. And my hairstylist kept asking me if I was pregnant for, like, a year. I'm like, what? No. <laughs> what you she's like, usually – a hair change like that is associated with a big hormonal change, and of course it was. It was thyroid, you know, autoimmune, but I didn't know that at the time. Right, and that's like the little things that you want to start picking up on, you guys, if those, if you're noticing little changes, like we tend to chalk it up and say, oh, it's just a part of getting older, or because we're women, we're going through like natural hormone, hormonal changes, and I mean, some of that is true to a certain extent, but aging does not necessarily produce these results. Like I work with plenty of women who've actually dealt with quote unquote hormonal changes or hair loss and now they're in their 40s or their 50s and by balancing out their body we're completely able to reverse that. So yeah. what, you what you totally want to pay attention to is especially if your symptoms start to increase. So you can see on like the autoimmune scale here like as you accumulate more symptoms, so maybe it goes from one to two, and then now more frequently throughout the week, you are climbing the ladder to autoimmunity in the mild category, and then moderate would be like two to three symptoms most days. So that could be something as simple as like having allergies every day, feeling like brain fog every day, and maybe feeling fatigued. And then severe would be three or more symptoms every day. So I know that when I work with my autoimmune clients and with myself, like once I was actually diagnosed, I had multiple symptoms on a daily basis. And I'm sure you could attest to that too, Molly, with what you were experiencing. Yeah, yeah. So, Mine eventually kind of like took me down and put me out of commission for a while, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, totally. So the crazy thing is, you guys, is that it actually takes like there's statistics, Dr. Tom O'Brien talks about this um, as well, that statistically it can take someone up to five years to get a diagnosis and they have to see maybe up to five different doctors because doctors are just not like in conventional medicine not educated enough about this in their you know medical school trainings. Like most of them don't really receive um, they receive five lectures or less, so it's not even a whole semester class and in some surveys that have been done, 63% of doctors, conventional doctors, say that they don't feel comfortable diagnosing or treating autoimmune conditions. So it's kind of a crazy place to be in. And the other thing to know is that you can actually have antibodies for autoimmune that are showing up 10 years before you get a diagnosis. So this is something that I didn't know necessarily when I started doing this work. And I'm sure Molly, like, you didn't know this either, but like now I know that if if somebody is suffering in this kind of way and I feel like they're really strong on the autoimmune scale but they don't have a diagnosis, we'll run a test that looks at those autoimmunity because auto or those antibodies because they may, may not be in a place of like clinical diagnosis yet where they would be clinically diagnosed with Hashimoto's or celiac disease or something like that, but we can still see the antibodies before they reach that clinical diagnosis and we can work to reverse it. And these symptoms would be an indication of maybe, you know, running that test to look at that, especially if you have um, like outsourced all other avenues and like everything, you keep coming up looking fine on paper, <laughs> like we did in yeah. some regards, know that there yeah, are tests out there to dive deeper. A very frustrating process and a lot of what delayed initially my healing was like not getting a diagnosis because I have mad props for anyone who's a doctor, but I just, because you're a doctor doesn't mean you specialize in all areas of medicine, like you said, and one PCP was just flat out incredibly rude to me, <laughs> and another one was like, you're a specimen of health, I wish all my patients were like you, and I'm like, but something's not right, you know, and it's, it's a frustrating place to be when you know there's something wrong in your body, but you are being told that it's either in your head or that you're perfectly healthy and you know that that's not true. Yeah, exactly. And just to, I, I was just was thinking, I use some technical terms for those who don't know what antibodies are, like those are predictors for autoimmune conditions. So basically what that, um, it's the Cyrex array number five test. You guys can go to cyrexlabs.com and look at it. You can't order it yourself. You have to order it through a practitioner, but you can take a look at that test and 
essentially like antibodies are predictors for, for autoimmunity. So essentially what we can see on that test is we can see if autoimmunity is coming 10 years before you even get a diagnosis, which is kind of cool and awesome about it. So um, let's talk about what are some of the contributing factors because um, you want to understand probably, well, how do I, like, what triggers antibodies to be elevated? Like, how do I get on this autoimmune spectrum? Like, what's happening inside the body? And as um, the pioneers in this kind of area, like, you know, a lot of people, Dr. Isabel Wentz, like I mentioned already, Tom O'Brien, Dr. Amy Myers, Dr. Karazian, like, um, who else? Like, Andre Nakayama, who've done a lot of work in this area, across the board, like all the, the research shows that there kind of has to be three requirements in place for an autoimmune expression to kind of happen. And one is that you, you have a genetic predisposition to it. So everybody will have a, a genetic predisposition to it. And uh, Dr. Tom O'Brien explains this really well as like it's your weak link. So everybody has a weak link somewhere in their body. And when chaos starts to ensue and inflammation um, increases, you know, wherever your weak link is, if that's your thyroid or um, your microvilli in your gut, like that will produce, and then either Hashimoto's or like celiac disease. So wherever your genetic weak link is, is where it would express itself. And so you have to have kind of this genetic predisposition to it. And then the second part is you have to have leaky gut. And for those of you who may not know what leaky gut is, essentially leaky gut is where you have your intestinal lining is no longer like functioning properly and doing its job. So it's not absorbing food particles and nutrients like it's supposed to. And it's not creating a barrier to keep toxins and food particles out of the bloodstream. So that's like the most key, like important part is that the intestinal lining is supposed to keep toxins and food particles out of the bloodstream. And when it's not able to do that and we get toxins and food particles into the bloodstream, then that's when the body recognizes like, oh my God, there's a foreign invader in here and it sends out the troops on the attack. And that's when inflammation increases um, and that will wear down the intestinal lining further. So you have to have that leaky gut aspect. And then you have to have some type of environmental or lifestyle triggers. So there's all different types of triggers. And most of us, you know, that reach a place of diagnosis or have antibodies, elevated antibodies for autoimmunity, have probably multiple triggers going on. So I know looking at my story or my, you know, over the span of my life, like, inflammatory foods. I was certainly eating a lot of inflammatory foods all the way up into like my early 30s or until I started doing the work that I do now. And there was definitely more late nights um, that happened consecutively over time. So lack of adequate rest. I was an over exerciser. If you guys are, you know, been following me, you've been um, seeing me talk about that is in terms of like pushing my body too hard when it was already fatigued. And then there's mental, emotional, or physical stress. So all of us have, you know, mental, emotional stress from work or relationships. And physical stress could be like, you know, if you've had um, misalignments in your spine because of a car accident or you work out and you don't stretch enough, like you have tight muscles, those can be physical stressors on the body. And then we have environmental toxins. And, you know, statistically what we've shown is that there's over 100,000 different environmental toxins that have been released um, in our environment over the last couple of decades and that number continues to climb. So we're just facing those all the time. And then as Molly's going to talk about like the negative mindset and energy aspects of it as that being a trigger and essentially that is kind of the study of epigenetics and how mm -hmm. um, we have the ability to alter our, our genes or our cells basically from a mental standpoint, like how our thoughts impact that. And then if you have any nutrient or vitamin deficiencies, like if your body's not getting the nutrients that it needs to function optimally, that creates what I call like vital voids in the body that would be triggers and set you up for autoimmunity. And then um, viruses like Epstein-Barr or as also known as mono, which statistically um, studies show that about 90% of the U.S. population um, is housing Epstein-Barr or monovirus in their body. And then there's hepatitis and herpes that also are really high incidences and viruses trigger autoimmunity. And then traumatic events, you know, throughout your lifestyle. Um, 
Uh, you think I'm missing anything in, on here on the triggers? I think that pretty much, those are like the bulk of the types of triggers, essentially. <laughs> yeah, and we'll get into it a little bit more. Totally. Yeah. Awesome. So essentially, you know, what, what we're going to be talking about tonight is how autoimmunity is a lifestyle condition or a disease and how you have the power to turn the genes on or off um, based upon the lifestyle choices that you you make. So this is the power of epigenetics, like I mentioned earlier. And um, if you look at, if we go back and look at those triggers and we were to ask you the question of which ones are in your control or which ones aren't in your control, so I'm just going to scroll back here real quick to look at those. So which ones are in your control and which ones aren't in your control, like the foods that you put in your mouth are within your control. You know, your sleep is pretty much within your control, how much you exercise, Maybe not the things that happen to you on a day-to-day -day basis that create mental, emotional, or physical stress, but you do have the control to do something about it, like how you handle it or how you de-stress. Um, environmental toxins, we feel like those are out of our control most of the times, and, and a lot of times they are, but there's certainly things that you can do within your home or your environment to control some of that. The negative mindset and energy, that's certainly within your control. And making sure that you get nutritious foods for um, nutrients and vitamins, that's within your control. Viruses, probably one of those things maybe not so much in your control, but from a lifestyle perspective, I mean, mono's called the kissing disease. So <laughs> maybe it was in your control at some point in time and um, you're out kissing too many boys. I mean, that's how most of us got it or sharing drinks with people, right? Uh, and traumatic events, probably not so much within your control, like lifestyle things are still going to happen, people still pass away, but again, what's in, within your control in that is how you handle it or how you deal with it, right? So essentially, it is a lifestyle condition disease, and, and this is where you have the power to actually turn it off is by changing how you maybe approach life and the choices that you're making, and the power of epigenetics is like inc absolutely incredible if you guys do some any reading or study on this. And I know, Molly, that you've read up a lot on this, and isn't it just fascinating how we have this ability to change, alter ourselves, like literally with our thoughts. Like that's so crazy. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and arguably, to go back to, to your last slide, and I don't want to get into anyone's business about this because, you know, I, <laughs> I have feelings about it, but it's like there's very few diseases that we are born with and we cannot control. So even viruses technically we contribute to on some level through our thoughts, through our emotions, through our lifestyle. So I don't say that to like make anyone feel bad or shame, but one of the things I talk a lot about is just taking responsibility for how we may have contributed to the things that are going on in our body. Yeah, 100%. Cool. Well, let's talk a little bit about the science side just to kind of set people up and give you some tools in this aspect, and then I really am going to open it up for Molly to talk about all of the behavioral aspects about it um, as it relates to some of the science stuff. So like we were just talking about you know, the three different things um, that you have to have for autoimmunity to present itself in the body, like basically what's kind of happening inside the body is, as Molly just said, like you're it's very rare that you're actually like born with a certain condition and sometimes you are but even we can look back and go if you're born with a condition that can be a result of you know the epigenetics of the mom and the dad so it's a, this crazy starting point that we can go back to and, and essentially you are dealt a deck of genes essentially but they don't completely define you so there are some genes that we don't have control over like if you're born with green eyes you're born with green eyes <laughs> that's not um, something that we right. can necessarily change through our thoughts, right? But <laughs> I would be. <laughs> my good man. Man. <laughs> I always want to be wise. <laughs> <laughs> but um, what we can change is how our body either you know manifests or prevents sickness. Like we do have the ability to um, change those ge genetic aspects of ourselves. So this is where our lifestyle choices, like I mentioned earlier, can either reduce or increase inflammation and metabolic dysfunction. So for example, if you're eating gluten, um, gluten is the number one top most inflammatory food that's out there. So if you're making the choice to continue to eat gluten, you're going to continue to raise inflammation in the body, which is going to continue to also wear down the intestinal lining and contribute to leaky gut. So that's a choice that you have that you're continuing to make on a daily basis. Or the negative mindset aspect, like 
if you continue to choose to think that like you just you know everything horrible is ever going to happen to you you're going to continue to attract that but it's also going to make you stressed out all the time like you're always thinking the worst that's going to raise your stress levels which is then when we are constantly stressed all the time that's going to dysregulate cortisol hormone which is our stress hormone and when cortisol is all over the place and that's going to create this cascade or domino effect to screw up all of our other hormones too so you know changing choosing to change that mindset right to offset that or reduce stress is beneficial and then things like toxic personal care products so that's a lifestyle choice like I have it's so um, fascinating and I know that I went through this myself I'm sure Molly you've gone through this too like my clients that invested in like high-end makeup like Mac right getting them to give up their toxic personal care products is like you would think that I would stri I was stripping away like their first child or something sometimes and um, I still wear some of my like toxic makeup I probably always will like you you'll find on this journey like you gotta like pick and choose you're not gonna be perfect about it but it's so funny you just said like someone's such a makeup person <laughs> totally <laughs> but and there's other like, things that you know I'm like totally I don't mess with and I'm just by the book with <laughs> exactly and that's where like you get to you kinda can like cherry pick right like what are the things that are really important to you like if you love that really high-end makeup type of stuff I mean I still have some of mine and I definitely wear it like because it let's be honest like Mac makeup just sticks like it's long-lasting when you're yeah. doing like an all-day thing right yeah. so if I have like an event like an evening event and I don't want to have like my mascara like budge or my eyeshadow budge then yeah I'm gonna use my Mac makeup but that's like once in a while versus wearing it every single day all the time or Maybe you remove all the other toxic personal care products like out of your environment in order to have that one thing so that you create that balance, right? It's just when we're like not mindful and then things start to accumulate every single day and pile onto our bodies. So it could be like maybe, you know, Molly, if you're using like MAC makeup, I'm, you know, I'm sure there's other personal care products that you went like organic and healthy with, right? So it's like creating. Yeah, yeah, I have like all of my body lotions and stuff. I'm a NARS girl, so that's what I do sometimes on my face. But um, yeah, all my body lotions and stuff like that and like. Right, right. so essentially like we want to take a look at like Kind of, kind of like pick apart all of the things that we're doing in our day and to ourselves and see like what is, you know, contributing to chronic inflammation because all of these things actually like the eating part, the mindset part, the toxic personal care products, like all these things, all these triggers, like the triggers that we reviewed a couple slides ago, essentially what they're doing is they are contributing to chronic inflammation and chronic inflammation is what's triggering antibody production. So kind of like I gave the example earlier of when you have leaky gut and toxins and food particles are getting into the bloodstream when they're not supposed to, your body sends out the troops, it signals the alert that something is toxic in the body and it sends out inflammation. Inflammation is actually our defense. Like normally inflammation is actually a really good thing. Like if you get a cut or you hurt yourself, you know, the body inflames for the healing process to happen. But when we have chronic inflammation that happens over an extended period of time, it actually overwhelms the immune system. And then the immune system gets confused and it can no longer distinguish between who are the good guys and who are the bad guys. And unfortunately, when that happens, it starts just attacking everything. And that means that it's going to start attacking even good, healthy tissue. So with somebody um, like Molly and I both have uh, had Hashimoto's, like it's going to attack the thyroid tissue. If you're somebody that's more prone, your weak link is like with celiac disease, it's going to attack the gut. If it's rheumatoid arthritis, it's going to attack the joints. So, um, and then as this, you know, attack continues to happen and if there's continual like assault, you know, to injury basically and continued inflammation, this is where it can attack multiple tissues and once you have one autoimmune condition, you're at a higher risk for actually, actually having multiple of them. So that's essentially what is happening, you know, inside the body is this attack, this overwhelm that's going on and um, that's what we want to calm down and that's where we can start changing some of our lifestyle choices to help reduce that inflammation and that attack that's happening on the body. So and there's, go ahead, Mom. 
No, you, you just touched on something quickly that like I just wanted to stress because I thought it was really important that once you have one autoimmune condition, it's you're prone mm -hmm. to get others. And that doesn't sound like much, but it is that is a lot. <laughs> and if you don't, if you feel like something's going on in your body and you don't get the right help, it's a harder and longer healing process. And that's what happened with me. Like I tested positive for like two out of the three um, markers of RA. I was having massive joint pain everywhere, and that's because it took so long to get an accurate diagnosis on that end. And so that was like a whole other layer of healing that had to happen that wouldn't have if I had tackled this earlier on. So that's why I love that you're sharing all of this with them because you're arming them with information to be able to go and get the right tests so that they know exactly what's going on. Exactly. And most and a lot of my, you know, um, autoimmune clients do have multiples. Like they have, I have, you know, clients with Hashimoto's and ulcer, ulcer of, I'm so tongue-tied. <laughs> colitis. I'm just going to say colitis because I'm so <laughs> tongue-tied right now. Um, yeah. Or like with RA, like you said, rheumatoid arthritis is another really like common one. So there's actually, depending on what your initial autoimmune diagnosis is, there's um, kind of like other ones that will commonly go along with it. So with Hashimoto's, like rheumatoid arthritis is actually one of the other common ones that most people get as well. And then Colitis also is another one too, and they're kind of all related in a way. So it just depends on what your initial autoimmune onset was potentially. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, there are ways to investigate and measure this. And uh, like we were talking about earlier is that, you know, in conventional medicine, and Molly and I have both kind of been through this, where doctors, you know, conventional doctors were overlooking this. And part of the problem with that, so that you guys know, because I talk to clients all the time and they're super frustrated. And like, well, I remember, you know, in your journey too, in the beginning, you were frustrated about this. You're like, why is my, like, why can't my doctor figure this out? Or like, why have they not looked at this? Like, it's this yeah. frustration. And as much as we want to like put them at fault, it's really not necessarily their fault. There's like, a dysfunction that's happening in our medical system and it's going to take time for that to get fixed so this is where you guys have the ability to empower yourselves and the the research is kind of scary here like it shows that you know on average it takes 17 years for new research to reach your doctor's desk and then you you know wonder if they're even putting that into practice when it happens so like Dr. Amy Myers in um, either her, I can't remember, it's the thyroid connection or the autoimmune solution book. Like she talks about how basically, you know, the overseeing body of the medical system, like they actually changed the ranges for thyroid, um, some of the thyroid markers, but no, none of the doctors were adopting it because for them to actually change their habits and how they're seeing patients, like that's even a bigger struggle for them, regardless of just getting the information in the first place, right? Mm -hmm. And on top of that, like I mentioned earlier, that doctors are just receiving very little training in medical school right now about autoimmunity. So 40% of them, there was a survey that was done and 40% of them say that they've received two lectures or less and um, a little over 63% of them said that they feel uncomfortable diagnosing autoimmune conditions because they just don't know enough about it. So the, you know, Molly and I both are in agreement that you need to find like the right uh, doctor or practitioners or teams of practitioners to work with. So a lot of times like my clients are working with me and they're also working with a naturopath because the naturopath is helping us to oversee, you know, medications that are needing and needed in specific diagnostic testing or um, that maybe I can't get my hands on or they're actually giving the diagnosis. and. I help to kind of support the client with the accountability and the guidance in between their appointments of seeing like the naturopath. And then sometimes you might need an acupuncturist and other like people. So you're going to need probably a team of people who specialize in it, but it's about finding the right people. Um, so you can look for, you know, functional or integrative doctors, but just because they say that they're a functional or integrative doctor does not necessarily mean either that they are up to speed on you know some of this information so you really want to go into a doctor like interviewing them and and educating yourself first and kind of picking their brain and seeing what they know before you know you maybe spend a whole bunch of money like doing work with them essentially so and that's so foreign for so many of us that never had health problems before and you just go in and you expect to get a prescription and go home and be better so it's a very different way of approaching healthcare. 
it's a very different way of approaching healthcare, and I really try to encourage people, like, you want to think of your doctor just like any other service that you would hire. So if you were to hire, you know, somebody to work on your car, like a, a mechanic, for example, like, you would, you know, probably have a conversation with them before you actually, like, agree to do anything, and you would probably want to, you know, um, maybe they were referred to you by word of mouth, you know, you know that their work is good already, and if that mechanic, like, forgot to put a bolt on your car that caused like something to happen, you probably wouldn't be going back to them. So if your doctor's not meeting your needs, it's totally okay to fire them and find a new one. Like last year when I was in the like depths of my mold toxicity stuff, I literally inter like I kind of interviewed multiple different doctors because I had a bunch of hormone stuff going on and I didn't want to take bioidentical hormones and I didn't want to just like get a prescription. I wanted to figure it out and I had to go through three or four different doctors before I found a naturopath that was actually willing to like listen to me and help me out because I couldn't, you know, I needed somebody to also help me figure it out for myself too, yeah. you know? Yeah. So, um, and some of, you know, the other recommendations that I have for you based on like doing so much work in this area is that you want to get what's called like functional lab testing. So this is going to be different than a lot of, you know, the conventional tests that you would see at your typical doctor's office. You know, getting a blood panel, a full bone blood panel is definitely insightful. So, you know, looking at your glucose, your hemoglobin A1C, your cholesterol numbers, um, your homocysteine, like there's all other types, you know, all things that they can run on a blood panel. Uh, but if we look at the, what's going on in the blood panel, if you have highs and lows, we still want to understand like why is that happening? So if you have high cholesterol or if you have high glucose, you still want to understand why is that happening? And that's where functional lab testing can actually look at how the different systems of the body, like what's happening with the gut, what's happening with the immune system, with the nervous system, um, with the hormones, hormonal system that would be contributing to high cholesterol. So we want to see what's actually happening functionally. So those are the types of tests that you want to be getting. And then also, you know, something that I really try to clue people in on is that you want to be looking at, when you look at the ranges, so TSH is like such a good one for thyroid because in conventional medicine, the, the range for TSH is like 0 0.5 all the way up to 4.5. That's a huge range. And the difference is in like functional health and functional medicine, the functional range is somewhere between one to two most often. Like that's a huge difference. So this is why so many people go in and get their thyroid tested and their TSH is like three point something and the doctor's like, oh yeah, you're within the range, you're totally fine. But that's not actually like a functional optimal range to be in. That's actually in a, a signal that something's not right. So educating I, yourself on what some of those like functional ranges are or having a doctor that's going to look at it in that kind of way. I, um, I think too it's really important because you know my message is all about get, getting in tune with your body and, and one way that I recommend that is through lab testing because I was floored when I started putting my message out there how many people would reach out to like try this supplement and that supplement because they're quote good for people with thyroid issues but what I learned through doing extensive blood work with my naturopath was like some areas of my body were absolutely fine that a typical thyroid person might need support from supplements. So getting to know your body's needs on that level is super important and not just self-diagnosing. Um, I had a conversation with a leading pediatrician in San Diego recently and she said that a lot of babies are being born with thyroid issues because their mothers are self-diagnosing and these supplements are so powerful that they're taking them and then the babies are coming out with hypothyroidism because they're so dependent on this supplement that yeah. their mother was taking when they were you know so it's just really important like I'm not I'm not a practitioner in this area but I'm like so pro all of this stuff in terms of understanding your body and taking the right steps exactly and everybody's like so different so I love that um, in Dr. Karazian's book why do I still have thyroid symptoms? He actually talks about, you know, if you have elevated antibodies, for example, for Hashimoto's, but actually your thyroid numbers like look fine um, or somewhat like normal, you don't need thyroid medication for that. And he says, even if the thyroid, you know, your T4s and T3s are off and you have elevated antibodies, he's like, thyroid medication doesn't fix autoimmunity. What right. fixes autoimmunity is figuring out what's triggering the antibodies in the first place. So most people like may take medication because I see it as kind of like relief care. So if you're suffering, 
you know, you want to support that thyroid or depending on what's going on in your life, you want to support, support your thyroid. Like when I received my diagnosis, I had toxic mold in my home and my mom passed away within a couple of weeks after that. So I knew that I wasn't really like in a place to be able to reduce stress, like physically capable. Like there was some things that I had to work through. So I knew that I needed some thyroid medication at a small dosage to get me through like the fog, to get me through that period when I could then kind of focus on myself. But that's not always like the answer necessarily. And just like Molly's talking about, it's about understanding like where your body is lacking and like working to coach up that function. And then you may not need everything, like all the supplements or the medications or whatever, but you need to understand your body better. Yeah. Totally. And just like I said earlier, you know, antibodies can be seen up to 10 years before a clinical diagnosis is given, which means that you can reverse autoimmunity before you ever be, become diagnosed with it. I mean, I just literally had a case today um, getting thyroid results back for a client and her antibodies are elevated, but they're not over the threshold. So we're basically catching her autoimmunity before she would be clinically diagnosed with it. And I'm so excited to reverse it for her because there's so many healing opportunities that she has that we can take um, tackle right now that she never reaches that point of being a clinical Hashimoto's case, which is awesome. So let's um, tackle some of the other aspects of this. So Molly, I'm going to let you take it away and totally talk about the behavioral side, like what's contributing to this for a lot of the people out there, and then we'll dive into how to activate and upgrade our bodies. Yeah, of course. Um, so, I mean, honestly, people only start working with me when they're like, nothing else is working. And and I was the same way. Like, my, you know, I was frustrated with my naturopath, even though he was amazing. Like, I finally found an amazing one. And, um, or he is amazing. And, um, I, you know, I turned to him one day, just like frustrated that I wasn't healing faster. And he looked back at me and he's like, I, I can't do this on my own. You need to be a part of this too. And I was like, whoa, like, <laughs> and it activated all of the stuff I've studied, you know, the positive psychology training that I've had and everything else and the epigenetics and all that stuff that I had studied and gone to trainings on. And it's like, oh, this is it. It's time to use that, you know. Because what I've seen with clients, and I saw in myself, is that um, especially, you know, thyroids, there's different autoimmune conditions, and they each have a connected underlying emotional behavioral pattern. But I'll speak to thyroid because that's, you know, what I often um, work with. So many women have thyroid issues. So, like, a lot of people with thyroid issues are perfectionists and um, people pleasers. And so we can be extremely critical on our body. So even that, even when we have a, a history of being healthy, we're, we're healthy because we want to look a certain way or we want to show up a certain way or we're expected to be, to look a certain way. You know what I mean? And so there's a lot of um, thought patterns related to that that are highly critical and emotions, like not, not feeling what's going on underneath. Well, when we don't do that, things stick to our body. Our body takes it on for us. Our body absorbs that. And with most of the women that I work with, it's literally healing emotional stuff that's gone on for years and releasing that. And then they will feel huge shifts in their systems. Um, behaviors. So to me, this whole process is really a journey in up-leveling your self-worth because we do have to make a lot of lifestyle changes. For example, you know, at one point I was off like every food that was enjoyable, basically. <laughs> and... It's, that's a journey in like owning that you're worthy of feeding yourself in a way at a point in time that helps you heal. You know, now I'm eating a lot more foods and my body is in a totally different space and I can indulge in cheese sometimes. You know, we just talked about this and different things. But um, when we don't own our worth, we engage in some of the thought patterns I just talked about. We don't give our space, um, ourselves space to heal we get sick and we get annoyed and we get frustrated with our body. I'm just talking about a cold. I don't have time to be sick. It's like, you know, imagine if that was your friend. Like, would you talk to your friend that way? If your friend had a cold or a flu? No, you'd like go bring your chicken soup. But to your own body, you're like, you jerk. I can't believe you're sick. I don't have time for this. And we resist it. We resist it. We don't take care of ourselves in these basic ways. Um, a lot of behaviors I see too with women are like indulgent self-care, which I'm all for spa days, but that's not really like 
self-care that our body needs to maintain itself and to stay healthy. So ignoring self-care on a daily basis and then doing kind of big acts of um, self-care. Lifestyle, so overwhelm and struggle. So autoimmune is a root chakra issue. Um, it's connected to the fight or flight response. And so a lot of women, men too, with autoimmune conditions perpetuate struggle in their life. And I know that sounds so crazy. Like, what are you talking about? I don't do that. No, we don't consciously do this. These are subconscious patterns. So we feel comfortable in patterns of struggle. For some people, it's because they grew up in abusive households or um, parents or addicts or just regular old life. They got used to a pattern of struggle that becomes comfortable, that becomes the norm. And so we begin to excel in struggle. We begin to feel comfortable with it. And that it's, it's a crazy pattern. And, and you might be listening to this going, that is just not true. And I would invite you to just explore it and see where am I creating struggle. You know, I've shared, we talked about makeup, like I love makeup. I was fighting with my makeup drawer every morning because, you know, on a daily basis, maybe I use like five little things of makeup, but I had like a hundred in there and it wasn't organized. And so I was literally like stressing myself out every morning trying to find the five things. And I know that sounds silly, but if you multiply that times the number of times I was doing that before I walked out of the door in the morning, I'm stressing myself out. And our body doesn't know the difference between a messy makeup drawer and a grizzly bear. To our body, the response that happens inside is a stress response that has the same effect. So where are you creating struggle in your life unnecessarily? Um, you could look like you're totally peaceful driving down the road having a great day, but in your mind you're like going crazy and attacking yourself or racing or um, worrying about the future or stressing about the past. It's like all of those things that are going on are taxing our body. And as we do that, we're teaching our body, like, how to be at war with itself, you know? And that was, like, the thing I had to get clear on. Like, where did my body learn to attack itself? Oh, my gosh, through me. <laughs> because I was always attacking myself for not losing that extra five pounds or, like, whatever it was. Or my lifestyle was so busy and overwhelming to, to block the emotions so I didn't have to feel on. It was just like, go, go, go. So it's that type of stuff. Um, the spiritual side, just being disconnected not aligned, um, ignoring your energy levels. So maybe you wake up exhausted, you slept for two hours, maybe going for that workout is the best thing you can do and it'll energize you. But if you are doing that regularly, you are burning your body out. And so maybe taking a slow, easy walk would be the better thing and honor your energy. Most of us, you know, I, I remember I posted something about how I was having a day where I didn't have much energy, which is normal, by the way. Like, our energy fluctuates, you know, especially, like, right now we're heading into fall. Our energy gets lower. We're not meant to have super high levels of energy that's the same every single day. And um, I remember I said I was having a day that I felt lower energy, and people were writing into my Instagram again, account, go get B12, go do this, go do that. And I was like, no, I'm doing none of that because I'm listening to my body. My body needs to chill today. That's what it needs. And yes, there was a point in time where I was doing B12 because my blood work came back and said it would benefit from it, basically. But we're such a society of like resisting, just like allowing our body to be tired for a day, for example. Like that's normal sometimes, and we yet we like resist it and fight it, and that's the that's how we perpetuate struggle in our system. So. Yeah. 100%. I could think of like a million examples in my own life of when I've done that. <laughs> I mean, yeah. the one that comes up really clear to me is when I was transitioning out of like the corporate space and trying to start my personal training business. And I wanted, I wanted success like so bad. I would take on any client, you know, just yeah. to make money. And I was, I was a trainer who went to people's homes. And so I was like, running myself ragged, like driving all the way from like Sorrento Valley, which for those people who don't know, like San Diego, that's kind of like north, like up in the north area, and then all the way down to like South Park, which is South San Diego, and like always in traffic and like feeling like I was going to be late all the time and this like perpetual like stress that I was constantly yeah. in all the time. And we don't realize that because we're trying to maybe, we think that those things are like giving us worth or like um, fulfilling our purpose in life when there's something else that's bigger that's going on. Like I eventually like had to realize that that, that mode of like work was not supportive to my health and I had to make a change to it, which was really hard to choke up and say like, 
this is not right for me, but I had to do it, otherwise I literally would have run, run myself into the ground, like, even more. And, yeah. Yeah, I mean, just little things like that, and I, you know, one of the things that I often will say to people is, our body will literally do anything that we ask it to, but that doesn't mean that we should. Right. Yeah, I mean, yeah, a different way I said it is, like, you know, I talk about manifesting with people, it's like, Manifesting health is actually the easiest thing because our body's like it's kind of like gullible in a way like it just wants to do good by us You know what I mean? So if we ask something of it It like wants to jump in and do it for us and if it's in a space where it can't we've pretty much done some damage with it Right and This is the actual healing this stuff I'm talking about now and and what drives me a little bit crazy is that everybody focuses so much on the food which the food is such an important part, but it's one part and if you're eating foods to support your autoimmune health, but you're um, racing in your head as you're doing that or you're criticizing yourself or you're engaging in all the stuff that I just talked about, you're totally wiping out all your efforts in the food arena. You know what I mean? And yeah. and the best part, like the what the part I love seeing with my clients, I know you see this too and we share clients sometimes with is like when you heal this stuff, you come out on the other end of this journey not only healthier but so much happier and lighter. And that's like the gift in this. There is a gift in this and this that's it. Exactly. I just posted something related to this today and like, you know, working on these things that Molly's talking about, this has been a huge part of my journey and making things stick so that I don't revert back to those old habits. So <laughs> Having to like, I've had to refine my diet over and over again. Like when I tell people I'm changing my diet, they're like, but you're the healthiest person that I know. What more could you have to change your diet? And I was like, well, now I have to eat differently because there's some things that I still need to heal or something like that. And being able to work through that stuff and make myself a priority. Like if I didn't work on the mindset things or the behavioral things like Molly's talking about, like, you know, changing my diet over and over again or taking supplements that I needed or cutting back on my exercise when my body's like tired or spending the money that need to be spent to like investigate and heal like I, none of that would have stuck if I hadn't been working on the mindset aspects also and really yeah. realizing my self-worth and that I deserve this like I deserve to feed myself the foods that it needs to heal and to spend the money on myself to figure out what's going on and that's like the biggest part otherwise and I see people all the time and I know you do too Molly that like you know, they're so down and struggling about how they're having to eat in a certain way to heal their body and like what yeah. if I like to change the perspective and be like, what if that's a gift that you give to give yourself every single day instead of something that's being taken away from you or like something that's being restrictive, right? Yeah. And starting to just look at it differently. Because like you said, if you're eating healthy but still beating yourself up about it, um, it's not really going to get you anywhere. You're going to continue to run into a wall. So exactly. let's talk about how we can actually activate and upgrade and what some of our recommendations are because we're already alluding to some of them. Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah. <laughs> the interventions for the behavioral side, the relationship with the body, we're going to talk about diet and rest, exercise, supplements, stress and toxins, kind of, these are all the different angles that we mentioned in the beginning, like you can't just focus on one thing, like one thing, like just your diet is not going to fix you, it's not going to heal you, it has to be this collective approach of all of these different things, so let's talk about that mindset side first, because like we said earlier, like you're just going to revert back to your old, like, sick, you know, beating yourself up behaviors if you don't work on the mindset aspects in conjunction with or before you even dive into some of the, you know, science-y kind of healing stuff. Yep, absolutely. Um, yeah, I mean, so to kind of do the opposite of everything I just said. <laughs> <laughs> but really learning, this is like a new level of loving yourself, you know, like when you I'm not saying accept forever, but learning to accept yourself where you're at and learning to accept your body at where she's at or he's at and, and, and being appreciative for what your body's able to do for you today will go so far in your healing because most people I work with are just criticizing their bodies for not having the energy they want. They're taking it out on their bodies. So the more thoughts that you have that can be compassionate and kind, again, focusing on your body as if it were your friend. How would you respond to your friend right now if she was sick and low energy and stuff like that? Um, emotions, I mean, that's where it is. That's feel it to heal it. You know, what is the stuff? Um, I bring people through a personal peace process to release stuff, and you would not believe the stuff that comes up. Some of it's like, you know, a 50 year old woman and she's still upset about something that happened in eighth grade. That's human nature. We like hang on to things. The more we release this stuff, the, the, we just clear space and we allow our body to have extra energy. 
experiencing more joy. Like perfectionists are joy suckers. Like <laughs> um, people who are in a pattern, I used to a pattern of struggle, which is a lot of autoimmune. It's the journey is to be able to experience more joy in your life, to be able to be easy with easy, not make things hard, you know. Um, build up that relationship with your body like I talked about where you're listening to what it wants and then responding in a way that's caring. So for example, I've been an athlete my whole life but and it was extremely hard but I just didn't even work out for a period because my body was that run down. And that was a gift to my body even though it felt so counterintuitive because exercise is good and this and that, you know. So learning to listen to what your body needs today because you have an expert within you and when you learn to activate that and listen to that you're going to heal so much faster. And I mean, we both have, and it, it is from this stuff. I mean, I was like sick in bed. Um, and two years later, I'm like, you know, crushing it at the gym. Where, <laughs> and I know, I know, like, I'm joking around, but other people that are still struggling with the same symptoms they had four years ago. And this is the reason is because they're disconnected with their body. They're listening to the experts out there. And you name some awesome ones, but, but you have an even bigger expert in your body. And when you learn how to listen to that, because your body's changing on a daily basis, you know, and um, when you learn to listen to that is when the true healing begins. Being connected to what's, like, important to you in life. Like, are you expressing yourself and who you are and what you want and what you need? Or has that just gone by the wayside and you are, like, a robot, work, you know, going through life? Like, you wake up, you go to work, you take care of your kids, you come out, da, 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 da. Like, I get it. Life happens. We have responsibilities. But when we are over-responsible, that's another pattern that is related to autoimmune stuff, we have to like make space for that joy and to get off the tracks of just being like the little chipmunk on the wheel. Um, and then honoring energy, which I already talked about, but it's such an important one. You know, we, we have such ego energy around our energy. Like, I should be able to do this. I should be able to do that. It's like, you know, well, do you question if you have to go to the bathroom twice within an hour? No. So why do we question like, you know, if our body is more hungry today or less hungry or like different things that fluctuate as we heal our autoimmune conditions, you know, just it's a little bit crazy how we have these rules in our head instead of just tuning into what we need that day. Right. So like, you know, like we gave the example earlier, if you got a crappy night's worth of sleep, like you probably shouldn't go hit the gym or like go run the next morning, like listening to your body's energy and honoring that it's tired and maybe doing that like long, more restorative walk or some yoga, like some gentle stretching that's still going to move, but not be over taxing your body in terms of like energy or what it needs in that moment in time. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So yeah, your body is your guide. It is, it has the most wisdom. And when you learn how to access that, you will feel more confident and happier because you realize it's a terrible position to be in when you feel like you're, you're reaching outside all the time for answers. And when you really truly embrace that there's a lot of answers within you, and I recommend, I mean, obviously I'm a meditation teacher that's just so critical in this whole process to reconnect with your body, it teaches us mindfulness. Um, mm -hmm. when, you, when that happens, everything unfolds. And, you know, a big part of it too is getting responsible. And so that's not blame. But getting responsible is about looking at the stuff we just talked about and saying, how did I contribute to this? How have I created a lifestyle that's not sustainable for my body? And how do I forgive myself? How do I accept where I'm at like I talked about? And how do I release some of the stuff, you know, uh, that over-responsibility? If I'm taking on other stuff for other people all the time, do I really need to be doing that? Um, and... I, I just talked about a lot of this stuff, but breaking the attachment to struggle, allowing joy, showing up authentically, envisioning you after you're healed. So it's like you 2.0, and I was just talking about this a moment ago, but this journey can be a gift if you choose to learn the lesson. But the thing is, like when we're meant to learn a lesson and, and we don't learn it, it's going to show up in a different way and it's going to keep showing up. So maybe you somehow get on like the right medicine or something but if there's a spiritual lesson to be learned in your health journey and you don't learn it with this specific thing another thing will pop up and for me I was like oh hell no I'm not going through anything like this again like I want to understand my root cause like my root cause to me like I love Isabella Wentz stuff but root cause to me is not physical it's much yeah. more holistic than that that's one piece of it and when you understand the root cause in terms of how I contributed to this, getting responsible about it, 
then you have the power, you have the knowledge to make shifts that will sustain long-term health and healing of this current situation. Yeah, exactly. And I know that for myself, like forgiveness was a big one because I was definitely a perfectionist. And yeah. And also, like, once I realized that how my choices in the past had negatively impacted my health, like, there was a lot of guilt around that. And I was like, how could I have done that to myself? But having yeah. compassion and forgiving myself for making those choices, accepting it, releasing it, and letting it go, and then, and then committing to making new choices in the future was like, it seems so simple, but it's like, it's mind-blowing once you actually kind of go through that process. And, you know, we all want to think, like, had you asked me, you know, a couple years ago before, um, like, I met Molly and I kind of did some of this work, like, if I, you know, had good self-esteem and confidence, I would say, hell yes, but that didn't mean that I was owning my worth at all, like, it's so much different now, like, people ask me all the time, like, how are you able to go to, like, you know, a party or go out and, like, not have alcohol, and I'm like, because my, I own my worth, and it's in, my worth is feeling like good, like that's what I want, and so I don't feel the need to like have to fit in with everybody else and do what everybody else is doing, like I'm checking in with my body and like it's, you know, making sure that my choices are worthy for myself, you know, all the time. So these are some of the mindset shifts that you guys are like so important to help things actually stick so that you don't rebound back to those old habits of like eating crappy food or doing whatever to your body that's like contributing to the sickness too, essentially. Well said. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about the other aspects of this, right? Because again, going through all the different, the multifaceted approach here is like, obviously there is a diet and rest component of this. We've kind of like touched on it a couple of times. So just to give you some top highlights on some of these things. And again, all the stuff that Molly's been talking about, the behavioral things, are what's going to support you actually being able to make these types of changes in your lifestyle and to stick with them. So like, you know, at a minimum, like eliminating inflammatory foods, like we talked about, like autoimmunity is triggered by an overwhelm of inflammation. So if you're constantly eating food all day long or frequently throughout the week, that is just, it's like throwing like fuel to the fire of inflammation. Like, you know, at a minimum, like cut out some of those top ones, like gluten, dairy, and sugar. And then if you're not, you know, getting results from that or feeling better, you might want to consider cutting out some of the additional AIP foods. Like Molly and I have both gone through a process to figure out, you know, what foods were triggering our bodies and removing those to give it some space to heal. And then eventually you might be able to add some of those things back in. Mm -hmm. And also just being like mindful and in tune and like giving your body high quality nutrient dense foods. Like, paying attention to how much protein, healthy fats, and veggies your body needs. Like, this is another aspect of tuning into your body, like Molly was saying. Like, I remember when Molly and I first started working together, um, what, I told you you could have bacon or something, and you were, like, so excited about that because your body needed more fat and protein. <laughs> oh, and it was, yeah. I was psyched because I was the classic not listening to my body, and I wanted to be, like, a vegetarian because of the spiritual yogi in me. So I was like literally eating all of the worst possible foods for my body. And then you're like, go eat bacon. And I'm like, what? Really? <laughs> yeah. Okay. And then you felt amazing afterwards. So it's like testing some of that stuff out and figuring out what your body needs. Because there is no one diet that's going to fit everybody. Like you just need to figure out what's right for your body. Oh, I was so mad at you. She, Jen had me like go order like a burger with like no like cheese and bun. It was just like with the bacon. And I was like, ugh. I don't want to do this because I was like so like wanting to be a vegetarian and she's like you have to notice how your body responds to it and I like left the restaurant I looked down and my stomach's totally flat and I was like satiated and I was like oh my god I'm so mad that this is what my body's happy with right now <laughs> that amazingly worked <laughs> yeah <laughs> Um, and that's like a game changer for a lot of people just by giving the food, giving their body the food that it needs. It can boost your energy and like give you instant results, like a flat stomach sometimes that you've been struggling yeah. to get for so long. So that's one part of it, but making sure that you're also getting sleep. And this is so fascinating. So critical sleep time for you guys is like somewhere in this window of 10 to, to 2 a.m. Like that's really you know important for you to restore your body at nighttime. But where the mindset piece comes in is like, I find so many clients are, you know, staying up late to work because they want to hit a deadline because they want to be the superstar person at work or like now when we have social media, like they don't want to miss out on anything. And so they're screwing up their sleep because of that. So again, working on some of that like mindset stuff 
is going to, if you're struggling in this area of getting to bed on time, like working on the mindset piece is definitely going to help you let go of some of that crap that's getting in your way of getting to bed and getting the rest that you need because it is really important. Like I tell my clients all the time, if you have to choose between sleep and exercise, I'm 10 out of 10 times going to tell you to choose sleep because it's so critical for your body, right? Yeah. And you know, exercise, everybody focuses so much on diet and exercise, and yes, those are pieces of the puzzle, but as we're showing, like, there's so many other pieces, and exercise definitely is important. You want to move your body and kind of coach up function, but you want to move your body just the right way, not too much and not too little. So like we said earlier, if you're tired already, you know, going out and, like, going for a two-mile run or more, crushing it at the gym is not going to be conducive for you. you like, you want to do something that's more restorative. And this was a big part of my story, like having been like a naturally active person and a personal trainer for so long, like I kept pushing my body at the gym and I was fatigued all the time. And so I like really to get over the hump and to put my Hashimoto's in remission, like I cut back on my exercise like extremely and my body like was able to get back to where it was and here I am like now I've been working with a trainer again like increasing my intensity but I feel fine like I'm not tanking afterwards like my energy is great so those are the things that you want to like look out for and kind of like weigh your stress burden um, all the time and, and if exercise and be assessing if exercise is an added stress to that and then as Molly and I like talked about, you know, supplements are going to be a piece of the puzzle and that's going to look different for everybody. You know, there's certain supplements that you can use for relief care. Like if you have acute things that are going on that you would normally take like a painkiller for, like um, headaches and stuff like that, there's supplements or essential oils you can use instead. And then there might be supplements that you need kind of corrective to actually facilitate the healing process. So that maybe is where you're lacking in certain nutrients so that your body can restore normal function. And then eventually like there's maintenance. Like I'm sure both Molly and I, I know for myself, like I'm on supplements still now just to maintain because yep. the reality is, is that even if we're eating 100% organic and nutritious for our body, like our food sources are just not as nutrient dense as they used to be. So there's probably going to be maybe a handful of supplements that you might want to consider taking for the rest of your life, like a probiotic or a multivitamin or something like that as well. And then kind of the last couple pieces of the um, puzzle here, you guys, as we start to wrap it up is, you know, overall stress and toxins and like creating that clear path for the healing to actually happen. So we talked about earlier, like environmental toxins can be triggers as well. Like environmental toxins were huge for me. I mean, I had toxic mold in my home that um, triggered estrogen dominance and that, you know, combined with how I was treating my body and all these other things like led to Hashimoto's. So you can look to like shift and swap out to less toxic, you know, lifestyle um, choices. Like we were talking about it earlier, creating a balance. So like, you know, I still use aerosol hairspray. So I would say that my aer aerosol hairspray and my dry shampoo are two toxic things that I certainly still use. But I created the balance with my other personal care products, just like Molly said with her makeup versus like her lotion, right? So looking at where are some of those things that you can start to like swap out or that you're willing to adjust and like some of the things that you might keep, but overall you're reducing the burden on the body by lessening the toxic load. And, and just wait. Oh, go ahead, Mal. Sorry, just the quick thing I would um, say too is that, you know, we're, we're throwing around the word toxic, but a lot of it is like how you receive things. So I, I also am wary of like seeing people get into a situation where they're afraid of everything they're putting on or in their body. Like if you decide to like when I wear my NARS makeup, that's probably not the best. I freaking rock it and I don't feel bad about it. I don't question it. I don't stress about it. Like, because that's actually like as worse, you know what I mean? As like actually ingesting something or putting something on our body. So it's important not to get into a space of like being afraid of everything while still honoring what's working and not working for your system. Yes, 100%. You know, it's like if you're going to do it, own it. Don't beat yourself up over it. Yeah. You know, like, enjoy it if you're going to yeah. do it. <laughs> right? Yeah. It's like I tell my clients, like, if you go to Italy and you're supposed to be gluten-free, but you eat the pasta and bread over there because it's absolutely amazing, like, I would do that too. Don't yeah. beat yourself up for it because that's just going to, like, contribute to the stress that your body's already under from eating that food. So yep. at least alleviate it that. And that kind of gets to our kind of last point here is just weighing your stress burden at all times. Like, understanding what kind of stress you're putting on yourself by maybe the, the thoughts that you're, you know, that are going through your mind, the work stress, if you're slipping up on eating gluten, if you're having a bad night's sleep, and like, how can you strike that balance? 
because it's a just like Molly was talking about energy it's an ebb and flow like I'm not perfect every single day in all of these things and there are certain times like I love to travel on vacation that I like will let go on some things but I know how to like create strike that balance and just weigh my stress burden and make be present in the moment and make conscious decisions that are right for me and my body and how to have that relationship with my body and let my body know like hey I'm gonna stay up late tonight but I'm sure as hell going to like treat you real good all weekend long and I'm going to take a nap tomorrow and we're going to go to bed early tomorrow night, you know? Like, I, and I love the word you just said because I think that's it. Like so many um, people who we help around this thing that come from that old diet mentality of like cheating and it's not about cheating, it's about consciously choosing and consciously managing your own yeah. health and that's so different than like, that's like indulging, like luxuriating in something versus like cheating and like doing something bad or not processing your emotions and then reaching for that food that you know isn't good for you over consciously choosing to indulge in it on occasion. Right. And it becomes like a more a place, you come from a place of empowerment when you do that. So I always like to play a little game with myself. I teach my clients this, like whenever you're faced with like a choice, like ask yourself, is it worth it? Is it worth you know, how you're going to feel tomorrow potentially from that food that you ate or staying up late and like maybe it is. Maybe you're going to go see like your favorite like band that, you know, you've been yeah. waiting your whole life to see. So like feeling like death tomorrow is totally worth it for that once in a lifetime opportunity. But if it's like your everyday run of the mill, like whatever thing, I'm like if it's your everyday run of the mill, like, you know, cheese that was store bought that's nothing special, I'm not going to eat that. But if it's like something from France, yeah, I'm going to totally yeah. indulge in that, right? So. Yeah. You know, constantly just asking yourself, like, is it worth it? And checking in with yourself to see what feels right. So, hope you guys found this hugely helpful in opening up your eyes to the possibilities of how you can activate and upgrade either healing a current autoimmune condition or how you can prevent one from happening if you feel like you're on the autoimmune scale. Like, Molly and I love to share this information all the time. We would love for you to stay connected with us. Follow us on Facebook, Instagram, check out, um, you can jump on our email list. We both blog really frequently um, to get more information and details on this to help guide you guys so that you can become more empowered and, and take control of your health in a way that you never have before. So, yay. Thank you guys. And this is much longer than we anticipated, but that's okay. It was good information. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Jen. It's always fun riffing. All right, guys. Thanks, everybody. Bye.